Good morning, everybody. Stand up and join us for the first worship of the new year. Sing it, Brianna. second this is a short one today first of all Natalie and Justin are traveling back today so we just ask that you guys lift them up in your prayers today and um, I hope they've had the best time I'm sure they have they've been at the beach y'all where it was sunny and this morning is it's a freezing so first of all happy new year you guys it's a new year but give us happy new year Thank you, Jesus, for the promise of a new year, just a new start, a fresh, something new, just closing a chapter, putting that one down, a 
picking up a new story. And God gets to help us write a, a new story this year. So I'm just so grateful for that. Uh, the few announcements that we do have are, number one, our game yesterday got postponed. We were supposed to play. It was supposed to be a championship level tournament, youngins versus old folks. That would have been me. But it has been rescheduled for Saturday the 22nd, same time, 10 a.m. If you are an old folk like me, you wear red. If you are a young folk like some of those people, you wear blue. Anyone is welcome to come, bring a poster, cheer us on, watch some of us get hurt. It's going to be a beautiful thing. It's just going to be something new and fun, so don't miss it. Saturday the 22nd at 10 a.m., Joe and Omar are kind of heading up this event, so we would love for everybody to come out. It's going to be a good time. The other thing um, is, y'all, we are trying to grow our outreach on social media. If you have Facebook, we need your help to grow our main Grace Family Church page. And you don't have to do anything but share it, really. And what we want to do is reach someone, maybe a friend of yours, or a family member of theirs who hasn't ever been to Grace, who may not know what real Grace feels like. And this is a good family to be a part of. And so I, I want to help be a part of that. And I need your help to help us grow. So I'm going to give you tools and, and ways to help us grow. And I think God's going to bless that effort. So if you will all stand back up. Katie is going to pray for us this morning. She's going to pray over our tithes and offering and over our service and over this new year. We have so much to be thankful for. God has blessed us so much. Thank you, Katie. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, we thank you that we get to come today and start this year off worshiping you. Father God, we just thank you for everything that you've done in our church and in the lives of the people of our church, Father. We're looking forward to a fresh start and to new growth within our church family. I pray for people who are out, who are traveling or aren't feeling well, Lord, I pray that you would just bring them back here safely, that your hands would just be over them. Father God, we give this morning to you that you would just speak through us as we sing worship songs to bring you glory. Father God, that there would just be an atmosphere of worship and that we would just feel your presence this morning. Speak through our pastor and just have your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
just know that He loves you. I want you to sing that with me this morning. You just leave your past in the past, and He's just waiting there with open arms. Let's celebrate that this morning. in this nice warm weather down in Destin, Florida, and uh, we're getting prepared for the one night of cold weather, and then we go back to our 80-degree weather here, but uh, praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, it, is, it is good to, I mean, we had a good, quick Christmas. It was like it was here and it was gone. Uh, it seemed like no sooner we got with the beautiful decorations and everything, we had about two weeks to enjoy it, and we started taking stuff down, and they'll all be gone by next week. Uh, and uh, I guess they left the lights off because they didn't want to draw attention to the decorations. <laughs> it's okay, but they'll, they'll, they'll be gone by next week. But one thing that won't be gone is, is the Holy Spirit. Uh, he abides with us forever. Christmas comes, Christmas goes, the holiday season kind of rings through, and you say, oh, we're back at it again. And, and that's true, and, and it happens every year and typically I would bring something about a resolution or a new year I just think that that what I want to talk about this morning is the blessing of obedience uh, if we're going to uh, serve God and you know we're going into the third year of the COVID drama that's what I and not the COVID trauma the COVID drama and, and, you know, I, I just think that people have wised up to what's going on. I do believe that it's going gonna, it's gonna to go away. This is God's way of healing it all. And, and I don't mean to speak lightly of it. I'm vaccinated. I'll, I, I'm, I'm just pro-choice. You, you do whatever you... I say that frequently. I want people to understand. If I need to wear a mask, I'll wear a mask. If I need to do whatever I'll need to do, I'll do. You know, I'm kind of like Paul. I became all things to all people in order that some might believe. Even so far, if it means me taking a shot that I really don't want to take to make people feel comfortable, I'll do it. And, um, and if you feel strongly that you don't need to, then don't. Use your freedom to choose to do that, and, and the Lord will bless you for it. But I, I think we have to, uh, if we're going to approach God through all the stuff that's going on, the one thing that holds true is His Word. And His Word is what we need to be obedient to. The real struggle today is who do we follow? The, the government is so upset that we won't do what they say. Well, I got a word for them. Yeah. They can hold their breath to hell freezes over, and I'm not going to do what they tell me to do. Amen? I'm going I'm to do what God tells me to do. I'm going to do what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. And uh, the Bible says that God is true and every man a liar. It means every man has the ability to lie, but God cannot and will not. And I'm going to do what His Word says. But that comes with an act of obedience. Many of us pick and choose what we're to be obedient in. I think if all of us would be honest and if we were able to sit down and just have a, just a simple word of conversation, 
uh, I think obedience would be an issue that we all felt that we could do better in. Obedient to God's Word, and I think it's super, super important. So I want to talk about the blessings. Before I do, I just want to uh, shout out to Bernie. Brother, this is your first Sunday. He's been visiting with us on Wednesday. It is good to have you. And Barry Spencer, my friend, good to have you. What a pleasant surprise. This is the guy that I told you guys about, that if I ever get to hear anybody pray, I want, I want it to be Barry. He just... If we're in a group and, and I'm in that group with him and somebody says, let's pray, it won't be Dr. Mike. It'll be Barry Spencer. And I just appreciate your ministry of prayer. And Bernie, you're a blessing to have here today. With your difficulty and what life has thrown you, you have proven faithful. And I am thrilled to have you here with us this morning. Welcome both of them to our service, if you would, this morning. Amen. God bless you. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts, and I want to talk about uh, uh, just a little bit about what Scripture refers to obedience. And normally when you start talking about the O word in church, people really get quiet. They get afraid. They, they, they get this sense of stonewalling, this, this attitude of rebellion almost, when you talk about obedience. Because obedience to God's Word sometimes takes us out of the driver's seat. Okay, and it takes us out of the, 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 the final authority on making decisions. Let me just say this. The final authority is always God's Word, whether you obey it or not. It's there. You either obey it or you don't. You either follow what God says or you don't follow what God says. And it's important that, that, we, that we get to uh, have the privilege of having God's Word exposed to us by the Holy Spirit. Not by some individual. Uh, God uses people like me and like you to share His Word, but it's the Holy Spirit that does the enlightenment, the illumination, and the revelation, and all the things that come. And here's the amazing thing. We, we get the light of God, and what we do, sometimes the light of God will make us afraid. Like little children get afraid of the dark. I said again, third week in a row, adults are afraid of the light. And the Word of God is the light. The light's our path, right? That's it's what it does. And it points us to Jesus, who lights the hearts of all men. But men love darkness rather than light. And what he's really saying is that men will reject God's Word because God word, God's Word always demands a response. Positive response always brings blessing. Amen. Let me say it again. Positive response to God's Word always brings blessing. You might not see it manifested at the point that you're obedient, but I can assure you, if you go down the road, it will bring blessing because Romans 8, 28 says that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to His purpose. And obedience in His Word is always for our, our purpose. And, and, and we get to see, hear, and do, and experience certain things, uh, you know, in life. And, and the problem, Isaiah chapter number 1, is a really good chapter. I shared with Brother Eugene this Wednesday, and I, th I, I thought it was really, really good uh, on Isaiah. Take your Bibles, turn real quick to the book of Isaiah. And let me, let me just, uh, chapter number 1. I was telling him, and he started quoting that thing to me. I thought, well, look at this brother go, man. I mean, he, he just knew right where we were going. But what we're talking about, uh, we, we love to quote Isaiah talking about the birth and talking about the, the cross and how he was prophetic. But in Isaiah chapter 1, the, the, the first 20 verses, what we find is, is a rebuke of God's people not being obedient. And it says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amazon, said, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, uh, Jotham, Isaiah and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, the wickedness of Judah. Now, by the way, there were some good kings, there were some bad kings, and he, he saw it all. And he says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken, for I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, in other words, I, I've taught them, I've shown them, they've had prophets, they've, and, and now they're rebelling. And any time we don't uh, adhere to God's word, it is an act of rebellion. If God says that we should not or that we should and we don't act positively, it is an act of rebellion, okay? And disobedience is really rebellion. You let your children disobey. What they're really doing is rebelling from your authority and exerting their authority. The same way we do God the same way. And then he says this, 
uh, the ox know its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. And because of this, alas, it's a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Why should you, and why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more, and the whole head is sick, and the whole heart faints. It says, from the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, and they've not been closed up. In other words, he said, you've created all this negative stuff because of your disobedience, and it's going to get worse. And let me tell you, the problem in America right now, it's going to get worse because people are not going to be more obedient. They're going to be more disobedient. And we talk about a great falling away. We got people in the church right now who profess to know Jesus and profess to be saved, but yet they won't set foot in a church. And that even offends people when you say it, but it is true. And the truth should not offend us. It should wake us up and say we need to be obedient to God's Word. He says, your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, strangers devour your land in your presence. Man, is that not prophetic to what we're seeing right now? And it is desolate, as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as, as a besieged city, unless the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant. We would become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Does that not identify where the United States of America is today? My goodness gracious, every time we turn around, we look more like Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what their outcome was. It wasn't good. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, they're not Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Israel, but yet he's referring to them that you've fallen so far. That's what you look like. And it's all because of disobedience. And to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of the fed cattle, and I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. He said, all this play-acting stuff and all this religious ritual that you're doing and all this name-it-and-claim-it garbage that's going on and all the prosperity gospel that's going on, he says, it does not impress me. It does not. When you come to me to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices, incense and abomination to me. The new moon, Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meeting. Your moons and your feet and appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you, and by the way, what, what had basically happened is all the customs of the land, rather the heathen, they all intermingled, and God said, I, I don't like any of that. You've got to get back to what you're supposed to do. I didn't intend to read all this, but it's just intriguing says this, I am weary of bearing them, verse 15, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourself clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. For though your sins be as scarlet, <clears throat> they shall be white as snow. What a merciful God. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I don't know why I'm overcome with such emotion except the mercy of the Lord speaks. 1 Samuel 15, 22 says, Behold, to obey is greater than sacrifice. And God has a wonderful plan for the people who are obedient to Him. I want you to listen to these verses. Again, verse 19, If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. The problem today is not what's going on it's not because of an epidemic or a health issue it's because of disobedience from the saved and the lost even the lost are required to obey what the lord god says they're building up judgment on them when they don't obey 
You say, wait a minute, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that's true or not. I, I can assure you, according to Scripture, it's true. Habakkuk 1.5 says, Look among the nations and watch, be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe even though it were told you. In other words, God's told us that He has a plan, he has, he has good things for us, He has a purpose for us, He's told us how it's going to end, He's told us all of these things, but yet we ignore it. We ignore it. In the Gospel of John, we find numerous times the Lord deals with us about being obedient. Chapter 14, verse 15, chapter 14, verse 21, chapter 14, verse 23, chapter 14, verse 24. I would have read those, but I'm trying to streamline everything and make it a little quicker and a little better so some people can get out and eat. Someone basically said that uh, our services are great, they're just a little bit long. Well, I'm going to cut them down, and then I want to find out what excuse you use not to come. Amen? 1 John 5, 3 says this, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome to us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, I know He's talking about Israel. I know He's talking about their future plans. But I want you to understand that we have been grafted in under the promises of Israel because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. There is no wall of separation. There is no wall of petition. What is the promise of Abraham is the promise for the Gentiles also. God is such a good God. He says, when you call upon me and go and pray to me, I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search me with all of your heart. In other words, God has a plan for us, and don't say that God's not here and God's left us alone. We'll find God if we seek Him. Amen. To enjoy His plans, we must be obedient to His will. The Scripture for today focuses on the people of the early church. The text I want to use is Acts chapter number 1. A couple of verses, then Acts chapter 2. You say, what is, what is it? Jesus gives commands, okay? And then we see what happens. So uh, their option in Acts 1, 2, 4, and Acts 2, 1 through 12, their option was to obey and wait or to get busy on their own. Their option was to wait and obey as God tells them to do, or either they can get busy on their own. Now let me tell you something. I have tried to get busy on my own, and I would have done a whole lot better off to wait and obey. And many people today are trying to do it on their own instead of being obedient. And they rationalize, well, I write a check and I show up. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. I want you to understand that. So I want you to be able to put, turn your finger and we'll look at what happens the first couple of verses of Acts chapter 1. I'll, I will do my best to be brief. As I summarize some of this, you'll have to do some work where normally I would give it to you. Acts chapter 1, the couple of verses say this, and uh, it says in verse number 2 of Acts 1, "...until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles to whom he had chosen." to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. And I'll just stop there so that you can have some, a little bit of time. But Jesus' last words were to give commands. They're not, commands, not, it's not optional. A command is something that we follow. So he gives them to the apostles, and then if you move on to chapter, uh, ch chapter 2, starting at verse number 1, you know he ascends into heaven, you know the story, but as we move on to allow you to see what's happening here, uh, in chapter 2, verse number 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now he tells them to go and wait and pray. Just, just wait, the Holy Spirit's going to come, okay? Now, it's been 40 days, they've been assembled together, He's been with them. All they have to do is wait 10 days. It'll be the Feast of Pentecost, which is a, a huge feast that they need to celebrate. And again, time will not allow me to get into Pentecost, but there's 120 believers. There's the apostles, and the Scripture says those apostles 
have about a, a, all totaled, the apostles and th these other groups, the number's about 120 people waiting. Other people had heard. Other, other people had heard about the, the, the resurrection, the ascension. Other people had seen, but yet we have 120 people that are waiting and doing what the Lord said. They obeyed and waited. We wonder what happened to those who left rather than obey the commandment of the Lord. Because with obedience always comes blessing. So many people get left out, outside the parameter of God, because they do not practice obedience. They think Christianity is a, a, a buffet and they can take a little here and a little there. But I want you to understand that Christianity is really a strict diet. It's such a diet that the, Jesus describes that it's a narrow road. You might say it's a narrow table in what you get to eat. But you have great freedom, but the issue that you do not have freedom from is obeying the word of the Lord. And we wonder what happened to those who left rather than obey the Lord's commandment to wait. So we're going to look at special experiences that came to those who waited for Jesus and obeyed. If you obey... God is going to not only bless you, but He's going to allow you to see things that you've never seen before. He's going to allow you to participate in things you've never participated in before. He's going to allow you to hear from Him things that you've never heard before. And He's going to allow you to walk in a presence like you've never seen before. And it's important that you understand, and we get this example right here as we look. And I want you to write this down as we move very quickly, as we look at what happened. Now, here's what happened. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Obedient people. All in one accord, all in one place. I find it very difficult to understand why the church is not all in one place and in one accord. We've allowed in the last two years political, economic, social issues disrupt the church, and that is a sin in the church. If those issues, though they be real, they could have been reconciled at the altar of God and by the Word of God. And instead, we've let it become an issue of division many times in the church. Not only that, we've allowed a health crisis to be an issue also. And in reality, we just need to respect each other's rights, use the wisdom that God gave us, and pray for one another, and know that God is on the throne. And we've allowed that to be a divisionary process. But they were all in one place and in one accord. And I say this, one of the reasons I stopped Facebook Live, too many people would rather listen at home. Man, I want you in the house of God. God's Word wants you in the house of God. The Holy Spirit wants you in the house of God. The principle of being a believer together is that we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but we come together and provoke one another unto good works. We lift up, we bear one another's burdens, we pray for one another, we get excited with one another, we cry with one another, we laugh with one another, we see God move, and look, you will never ever convince me, uh, Brother Juan's back over in the corner, he's missed about three months. I've been to see him in the hospital a couple of times in rehab, and all he talked about was coming back to church. And the brother's on a walker. He, he broke his hip. Check it out. Juan, you're 80. Is that right, brother? You know what he was doing? Playing football in the front yard at 80. I thought, man, i got to have him back in church. i got to have an 80-year-old that catches and throws passes. Amen? I'm going to put him on my team. We play the youth. Yeah, you, 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 you ain't got a chance if I got one on my team. He breaks his hip, and the only thing he really cares about is being back home and coming to church. Now, that's some good stuff, man. I'm glad to have him back. But, but we got other people who have decided that church is no longer part of their agenda. He wanted to get back because he just didn't want to miss what's going on. He didn't. And Juan, it is good to have you back, my friend. Amen. But let me tell you, it says what happened, it says they were all one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues or cloven, the word Greek word illuminous. It's a, it's a tongue that illuminated. 
lot of people say it had fire on it. There wasn't fire that set upon each one. It was a tongue that illuminated them to see and do beyond what they had ever done before. Okay? As a fire. As a fire. And one set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, or the word glossolalia. Again, my message here today is not about tongues. My message here today is about God allowing obedient people to experience something that they'd never experienced before. Something that changed the course of the church. It changed the course of history. It changed the course of eternity, is what it did. And it says, with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, or glossolalia, language, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, it's going to go, and it's going to explain. It's going to explain the 11 nations that were there. It gives reference that they each spoke in a tongue from the land that they were, and people from those lands, because it's the Feast of Pentecost, was able to hear in their own language. It was a supernatural act of God given to 120 people that had been obedient and waited for the Holy Spirit to come, and now this experience comes in, and it changes the, 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 the dynamics of everything that's about to take place in the future. Here's the thing I want you to write down. It was a moving time unlike anyone had ever experienced. Now, the one thing that draws my mind, those folks that left, that did not stay with that 120 and just wait 10 days and pray for the Holy Spirit to come, I wonder what they thought when they saw this incredible experience that was going on. By these people who had no more giftedness than you or I, it was provided by God Himself in the form of the Spirit. There's no spiritual elite here. There's no people that, that have done something that other people don't have the ability to do. All they did was be obedient and pray. They waited and they prayed for God's Word to manifest itself with truth. The Holy Spirit swept, o- swept over them in an overwhelming manifestation. You can read about it. A- again, read all of chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. And let me just say this. It is good to experience such emotion. I want to tell you that following Jesus Christ and obeying Him always is a good thing. You should get excited sometimes about serving the Lord Jesus Christ. When a sinner gets saved, there's rejoicing in heaven, but people on earth sometimes are looking at their watch, can't wait to hit the door. Our prayer should be, praise God for what He's done. Is there anybody else that needs to be saved? When God heals someone from cancer, or does a miracle in someone's life, or takes a couple that's ready for divorce and all of a sudden reconciles them back, and the glory of God starts to shine on their life, we ought to rejoice and we ought to be excited about what God has done through the Holy Spirit. It is good to have emotion serving God. We get emotional about a ball game. We get emotional about children being born. We get emotional about sweethearts. We get emotional about weddings. We get emotional about freedom and all these other things. We, we get emotional about everything. But when it comes to experience some, some, some movement of God that's outside the norm, we clam up and we're afraid to even get excited about it. It is good to experience such emotion. Obedient Christians always have a, we use this term, a warm feeling toward God. And we use the warm feeling because we use the phrase warm and fuzzy. We just, there's just something that feels right about being warm and fuzzy and cozy. The proper term is, is really this. Obedient Christians should have a spiritual feeling toward God. There's something that should stir our spirit. Now, I know it makes us feel warm and secure, like we're wrapping a blanket around ourselves. So we say we have a, this warm feeling when we're obedient to God's Word, but what we're really having is a spiritual experience that makes us feel warm and accepted. So they're open and responsive to the movement of God. See, it, 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 it's the open door. Obedience is the open door to spiritual experience. Disobedience is the open door to spiritual experience also. It's just not positive. It's negative. You disobey God, and I can assure you, as God is on the throne, chastening will come for those that are truly His. 
And if you don't have any chastening, then you may not be truly His. You say, now that's very controversial, Pastor. I know, but it is what it is, right? I'd, r- I'd rather have you examine your life than allow you to go through your life and say that I have no sin and I deceive myself and the truth is not in me. Because the truth says that if you truly are His and you are disobedient, you will experience the loving chastening of God. Because He chastens whom He loves. You understand what I'm saying? Disobedient people are afraid that they will give away their true selves. I, I, I got to stay away because the more, the more Pastor Mike preaches, the more I, I feel like I need to do something. I feel like I might need to go to the altar, so I better stay away because, see, if I go to the altar, my true feelings and my true emotions might be exposed, and I might experience something that I'm terribly not sure of and I'm afraid of. But let me tell you this. If God gets a hold of your soul, you don't need to be afraid. And if God gets a hold of your soul, it might be beneficial for every one of us to experience it. Man, that's what brings the glory of God. But see, disobedient people are afraid they'll give away their true selves that it exposed to us. Wouldn't it be great for the people who are obedient and willing to turn turn God loose in their lives? Look, if you're an obedient believer here today or you're deciding to... Let me just say this. Let the Holy Spirit have all of you. Some people want the Holy Spirit just to have the academic part. I want Him to give me a revelation. An illumination, and I want to be able to exposit His Word. Let me tell you something. You, be careful. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You can study all of this Word that you want, but if that Word does not resonate the God of the Word, you ain't got one thing that you need. This Word is to put you in the presence of the God who wrote it. It is an aid to get us to where we need to be by God Himself in the form of the Spirit, and it comes with obedience. When you disobey that book, you've shut the door for the presence of God to be in your life. You understand that? You say, I don't believe it. You keep practicing it. You'll see what I'm talking about. Why do you think there's going to be such a great falling away in the last days? It ain't because Satan has so much power. Satan can't make anybody do anything. He has no dimension. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. You know what's going to make the great falling away? Disobedience. When the word has truly been manifested and people know what to do, they're saying, don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's a sad state. Maybe that's why I wept. Wouldn't it be great if we just let God just, just... Turn him loose in our life. Jeremiah 33 says, Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you don't, you don't even know about. You know why we don't know about it? We're afraid. So it was a moving time unlike anyone had ever experienced. When you're obedient, you're going to find some things in your life that will absolutely move you to a spiritual experience that will change the course of your life. It'll change the direction of not only your life, but those that in your family. A lot of guys, you're wondering, what's going on in my family? Let me just say this. Daddy, husband, leader of the home, you chart the course. You do what you're supposed to do, and you will be blessed. Your family will get in line. But you can't be in, and you can't be half out. You can't be half in. You've got to be all in. You can't obey just what you want to obey. You've got to obey the hard things, too. You got to come when you don't want to come. You got you got to stand out. Because see, it, it was a moving experience, but it was also write this down. It was a mystical experience. Serving God is a mystical thing. Sometimes when I say mystical, it's a mystery. Not mystical because it's magical, though it seems like magic sometimes because we don't even know how to describe it. It becomes mystical. It because, because it's something outside the norm. We operate very well in the flesh. How many of you operate very well in the flesh? Just give me an amen. Before you were saved, you had no trouble doing what the flesh said do, right? Now, when you got saved, it became a little different. But even now, we still know how to operate in the flesh. We don't ever forget it. It's always there. It's, it will always be a struggle, the flesh. But thank God we have the Spirit now to put an obstacle to us rendering to the flesh. 
becomes a mystical experience. But let me just say this. Some things cannot be explained or understood. They can only be experienced. They know God's behind it, but they didn't fully understand it, and it changed lives. In verse 6, we read how those present understood in their own language the words of the disciples and the 120 that were there. They, 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 and people tried to reason in it. They tried to make it logical. There are just some things that God does that we'll never be able to understand. Why God heals some and not others. Why God brings some prosperity and some other people never seem to achieve it. Why God gives some a certain amount of wisdom and understanding and others seem to always be lacking. We sometimes, there's, God is such a mystery, we can't explain it. Why God would forgive the worst sinner of any situation you might ever encounter in your mind, and you can't fathom it. But He does. Amen. And His ways are not our ways. It becomes a mystery to us. We don't even understand and sometimes how the church even functions the way that God intends for it to function. Wherever... God moves, some mystery is involved. We see a brother or sister saved or a life turned around or a miracle done, and we, we just scratch our head sometimes. I, I'll be honest. There are some people that I thought ain't no hope in hell they'll ever get saved. They're, they're about as bad as i ever seen. They got the meanest spirit. They'd spit on you. They're vile. They're wretched. And all of a sudden, they get saved, and I just stand back, and, and I'm saying, holy smokes. Holy cannoli, look at what God has done. And then I'm skeptical. Did they really get saved or are they conning me? Right? And all of a sudden you see this, what God has done, turn into one of the greatest vessels and tools for the gospel that you've ever seen. And then all of a sudden you think, isn't it amazing how God works? That he'll take a life that was once over here and all of a sudden put him right here and he never bats an eye. He never doubts what he's doing. And here we are. It is a mystical experience. Whenever God moves, some mystery is involved. In Job 5, 9, we read, he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. The Israelites did not understand the destruction of Jericho. They certainly didn't understand the parting of the Red Sea. I can go on and on and on. They didn't understand how everybody else was scared of Goliath, but you got a, a young 14, 15-year-old kid with some rocks and a sling able to conquer a giant. How the Saul, head and shoulders above everyone else, chosen by the people, but yet he couldn't be king, but you got a shepherd boy who can be king. Got a shepherd boy who is terribly flawed, who commits some awful sins in his adult life, but yet he has a heart like the heart of God, and he will obey God in anything God tells him to do. And God said, that's why I picked him. I didn't pick him because he was perfect. I picked him because he would do anything I told him to do. Think about it. Think about meek Moses. The Israelites didn't understand, and ladies and gentlemen, you will never understand, but one thing, that when, when you are obedient, there'll be some things that happen. It'll be a moving experience. It'll be a mystical experience. And I'm glad it's not the same old experience. I'm glad the mystery allows me to know that God is behind what's going on, not some individual. Obedient people have unforgettable experiences. Man, I've had experience of forgiveness of God, the release from sin, delivering from deliverance from things that, that get in my way of serving God, and I know you have too, and I'm not the only one in that person, but real life change and growth only comes through obedience. And if you've never experienced what I'm talking about, probably you've not been obedient to the point that God has control of your life. Because see, as long as you're hanging on to a little bit, you're not really being obedient. God wants all of you. And when you surrender all of you, I promise you, your life will never be the same. You've got to be obedient to His call, obedient to His Word, obedient to the Spirit. It was a moving experience. It was a mystical experience. But let me tell you, it was a melting moment also. If you look at 
all the way through verse number 12, it says this. It starts with 120 people. Well, it starts with some apostles. Then, then there's some other followers that, that the ministry's gone out a little bit. And, and now they preach, and all of a sudden, that 120 leads to 3,000 salvations. Do you understand how many people have to be in a crowd for 3,000 people to be saved? And not everybody got saved, but everybody there witnessed something that was a moving experience, a mystical experience. And all of a sudden, they see this melting moment. It, you know what binds us together? It's not color. If it, color doesn't bind us together, color shouldn't sep separate us. It's not social economic status. It's not any of that. It's not where we live. You know what really, really binds us together? What really binds us together is the love of God. It's that melting moment that saved people know instantly in our heart that they're the same as anyone else that saved. There's no difference. It blends us together. It was a melting moment. What started out as 120, 3,000 get saved, but other people are witnessing this melting moment. All of a sudden, it did not matter where anybody came from. It didn't matter what they looked like. All of those countries, those customs were different. The one thing that melted them together was the marvelous, wonderful works of God and the preaching that Peter brought that through Christ, through Christ, they could have a new life. And it melted them and it blended them together. It's, I, I kind of look at it this, this way. These ob obedient people were blended together in a very special way. How many of you know, like to make a cake? You, you blend that stuff together, right? You can't make a cake with one ingredient. You can't make metal stronger with just a certain kind of metal. The more you blend it, the more you work it, the stronger it becomes. It's, a, it's important that you understand it. Even coffee, I blend my coffee. Sugar, a little cream, right? We grind our beans. We like it a certain way. We, like, we blend it together to get it to where it needs to be. That's what God does in this melting moment with us. He blends us all together. That's why Grace Family is such a special place. We're blended together. And we don't let anything separate us. We're blended together by the love of God. We're blended together by the Word of God. Most of you are here because you like to hear the Word of God. Amen. You do. And that's, that's what you like. And obedient people are so focused on their relationship with God that they easily relate to one another. The only difficulty we'll have is when people do not want to be obedient to God's Word. And that's the thing that unblends people here. The thing that brings us together is the Word of God, obedient people. They experienced wonderful fellowship. You can read verses 42 to 47. They broke bread daily. They went to one another's house. All they were talking about was the Word of God. What is God doing? Wasn't it amazing? We, we saw what happened. 3,000 people get saved. And, and by the way, the stage is, is being set for many other people to be saved. The stage is being set because when they spoke in those languages, you know what they heard? The marvelous, wonderful works of God and the saving knowledge and plan of God that if anybody calls on the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. So 3,000 get saved, but you know what happens next time? 5,000 get saved. You know what happens after that? 20,000 get saved. Do you understand that in a matter of just, just a, a short period of time, Rome ruled the world, but in less than 77 years, the world religion became Christianity in 77 years. 77 years was the principal ruling religion on the face of the earth. And 12 people, the Bible says, they turned the world upside down because they were obedient to what God called them to do. It was a melting moment. Have you ever had a melting moment that you blended in with something so spectacular that God moved? Obedient people, see, they know how to love one another. When Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another, they get it. It's a new commandment. Obedience. Well, it was a moving experience. It was a mystical experience. It was a melting moment, and it, was, it, it created a movement that was born. We all talk about right now, I, I hope you're as conscious as I am, the great falling away that appears to be happening. I was shocked when two news stations, and it wasn't Fox, it was ABC and NBC said that the church has experienced the greatest falling away 
that they've ever seen. That over 50% of the people that were members prior to COVID will not return back to the church. I'm very optimistic. I don't believe that. I believe some will never come back, but I also believe there's going to be many that return. Holy Spirit's still working. And I'm going to keep on preaching. And when I say the church, this church, I'm not going to be satisfied till I get everyone back that I can get back or they tell me, no, I'm not coming back, don't call me no more. And I'll probably still call you again. I'll give you a couple of months and I'll call you again. That's what I'll do. Amen? But a movement was born. These obedient people started a movement that affected the whole world. And what's happening now, what, what's happening now is that there are a lot of obstacles in the way. It was the birthday of the church, and they grew dramatically. The church grew dramatically. Nothing stopped the church from meeting in the early church. Persecution didn't stop it. They throw the preachers in jail. Didn't stop it. You know what happens? They, they pray. The believers start praying for the preachers. Imagine that. Imagine what would happen if people started praying for the preachers. Don't be lying to me. Ain't none of you hardly prayed for me through this holiday season. All you've been thinking about is yours, and I'll be honest, ain't many of you I prayed about either. We, we had ours and we was doing ours, but obedient people, we should be praying constantly for one another. You want God to move in the church? Pray for your staff. When the preachers were rested and thrown in jail, see, I'm willing. I'm going to preach. If they arrest me, I, you better pray. You better post bond. You better have a fundraising deal to get me out of jail because I'm not going to stop preaching the gospel. I'm going to say what needs to be said, and if I get arrested, then so be it. Amen. But see, in the early church, when they got arrested, the people would pray and protest. They showed up at the jail. And what happened? God showed up at the jail. God unlocked the doors. All you got to do is read. See, nothing stopped the early church. Not religion. They told them, don't preach. But, well, wait a minute, it's okay. It's okay to preach as long as you don't talk about Jesus and salvation. <clears throat> don't preach in His name. You can talk all you want, but don't mention sin. <clears throat> don't talk about being saved. Be sure to tell everybody how good they are. Be sure to tell them that they can have their best day today. Right? Be sure to tell them, just go buy a book, and you'll learn everything you need by a book that's been written four times by the same person. Everybody's promoting books. Let me tell you something. You don't need to go buy a book. You got a book. Just open, read it, and obey it. I promise you, you'll find what you're looking for. Nothing stopped the early church. Not the government, not religion, not race, not persecution, not social issues, not the unsaved, and not Satan. You know the only thing that stopped the church? is the church. Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. And here we are, we got our tail between our legs, and we're afraid to say what we need to say, and we're afraid that people won't like us, and we won't get likes on social media. Who gives a flying rip if you get a like? I'd rather God say, that is what I want said, and let the people turn from their sin. You know what it says in, in, in Ezekiel? He says, I'm looking for someone to proclaim for me. I was looking for a watchman. I was looking for someone who'd preach, and nobody would preach. Nobody would tell them that they were wrong. Nobody would hang out the light and say, here's the light. Here's the, we're, we're headed for trouble. And he said, I can find no one in the land. I promise you, we need some Billy Grahams to rise back up. We need some men that, that will say it like it needs to be said. And not be afraid and not be worried about being woke and all that junk and crap that's going on preach with courage preach with integrity preach with boldness preach with truth preach with life and preach with faith that god is on the throne and you'll be fine if you'll just preach <laughs> nothing stopped the early church the movement was powerful 
verses 40 through 47. Let me look at these verses. It's incredible that you, that, that you think about some of this. And it says this in verse 40. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. I could preach this message today and it'd fit. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. The church was born with great power. The church, let me let you in on a secret still has great power. We're still in business. Word of God's still here. As modern day believers become obedient, we too will experience special times with God. Galatians 6, 6 talks about sowing and reaping. If we sow corruption, we're going to reap corruption. If we sow righteousness, we will reap righteousness. If we sow good news, we're going to reap good things. It's important. Let me close with this. Obedience does not always lead us down a comfortable path. As long as everything's comfortable, everybody's okay. I have learned that I'd rather be a little uncomfortable. Let me, let me let you in on a little insight with me. It is not comfortable for me to say some things that I say sometimes. You say, you're just cocky and bold, and you, you just think you the cock of the walk, like Peter. Look what happened to Peter. Yeah, look what happened to Peter. Peter got it so right that when he preached, when he all of a sudden had the anointing of God, all he had to do was walk in the street and his shadow healed people. Yeah, call me a Peter. Call me flawed. Because you're, you're telling it like it is, brother, sister. I am flawed. And I am loud. And I am long. I'm working on it. But I ain't afraid. And what I mess up, God will fix. Because my intent is right. And God knew when He called me, the mess He got into with me. Just like He did with every one of you. But I've determined I'm going to be obedient. And it's not always comfortable. Let me give you another thing. As I'm closing... Obedient people have special experiences about which others only dream about. I cannot help but to say, I cannot help but to say it again. I cannot. When you become obedient, your faith in God becomes such a steadfast thing that you believe you can stick out your hand in a time of crisis, in a time that you may lose the thing most dear to you, and that God will heal it. And that God will touch it. That 27-minute ride from my house to that hospital when Phyllis had the heart attack, and I knew that she was going to go. And she said, call an ambulance right now. I cannot make it anymore. And I promise you, from the moment I said, Lord, just let me secure her. And I was gripping the stern wheel with the palm of my hand because I'm in the palm of your hand. And I promise you, the pain went away from her. The anxiety went away from her. When we got to the hospital, I thought, she is perfectly fine. She gets out of the car, doesn't even need a wheelchair to walk in, and she says, I feel better. And it wasn't 30 seconds they willed her in and said, Sister, you're having a massive heart attack. My point is this. When you're obedient and God is anointing your life and blessing your life, you can just reach out your hand and say, Lord, I am trusting you because I can't do it. And you know what? God shows up and you will experience I know some of you don't believe it because, see, you've never experienced it. My confidence in God was so much, I thought, I'll not lose her. 
God's not done with us yet, because basically if He had been done with her, I couldn't have seen any future without her. You understand that? One flesh. I get to preach every Sunday with the privilege of standing before, but you know what? She has to sit. She's had to sit for 47 years and listen to me. She's been in ministry from day one with me. And God says, I'm not going to let the other half of you die. I'm going to keep you together, whole. I'm just telling you, you never understand it until you experience it. You've got to trust God to the point that it's outside the norm. And you can't do it if you're not obedient. Disobedience will separate you from the presence of God. Let me give you the third thing, and I'm closing. It's only 1207. Everybody say amen. You're doing so good, Pastor, in this new year. God is looking for some people who will allow Him to have His way in their life. I'm telling you right now, folks. Kenny, this is when I, I can get you to come if you're here, brother. Uh, there's some people right now. You are struggling with allowing God to have His way in your life. You're struggling with it. And God is looking for some people who will allow Him to have His way in their lives. Let me put the slide up. John chapter 4. But the hour is coming. And now is. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. For God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And if you're disobedient, you're not in truth. And if you're disobedient, you're not obeying the Spirit. And I can assure you there are some right now, right now, that God is dealing with about allowing Him to have His way in your life. I want you to bow your heads with me. <clears throat> Here's the amazing thing about the Spirit. He's speaking to you right now. And you know exactly, and you, you understand it very clearly, who you are. And if you need prayer right now about yielding yourself, just surrendering yourself over to God, I want you to stand right where you're at. You don't have to come forward. Just quietly stand right where you're at. I want to pray for you that God will show you exactly what He wants from you. Just stand. God bless you. And you. And you. And you. And you. There must be 10 or 12 people standing. And you. Obedient people will have this unusual experience outside of the norm. And God has a plan for each and every one of you. But you've got to yield yourself to Him. I want to pray for every one of you that are standing right now. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Would you give the Lord a praise clap here today? Amen. Amen. Man, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. You guys have been magnificent. You've been great. Be here Wednesday night. I've got a good word as we're talking about spiritual gifts again. Let it be your habit again. Barry. And Bernie, God bless you guys. Juan, good to have you all. Let, see, if we had all the people that could come, it'd be blessed every Sunday to have new people back. We love you guys. God bless you. Hug somebody's neck before you leave. Fist bump or whatever you do. Amen. Praise the Lord.